And I'm going to talk about building secure ASP.NET Core MVC applications. First, to get it out of the way, who am I? My name is Nils Tanis, and as you probably might have heard, like I'm from the Netherlands. That's the accent. I work as a security researcher for Vericode, part of CA Technologies. And in my job, I mostly focus on our static offering for .NET languages, so our capabilities of uh, scanning those types of applications. I've got a, a background in .NET development, and I've done pen testing, security consultancy. So it's really combining all those stuff together, and it's pretty, pretty awesome to do. So let's first define the story what we're going to talk about. I think, in general, if you say building secure applications, it's definitely a tough job. It's hard. Building applications, I think, in total, is, is definitely hard to do, especially if you use a new framework like ASP.NET Core MPC, which is like completely rewritten from scratch. Yes, there is a relation between ASP.NET, but it has been started up from the ground, and it's completely like newly done. So you can question, like, how does a developer know uh, if he does the right thing? If you're creating a new project, like, how are the defaults? How will they help you out taking the right decisions? Or is a mistake easily made, right? So in general, that's the main topic that we're going to cover related to uh, two types of vulnerabilities, uh, cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgeries. And it's based on this agenda. First, I'm going to do a brief introduction, talk about .NET Core, ASP.NET Core. Then we're going to dig into one big aspect of it, that's the MVC pattern, because that's like the basis on how we're going to continue on talking about how applications will process data, right? So it will accept data from an external source, and it will make decisions based on it. It will do stuff. Then we're going to see like how we are able to return data, right? So that's the presenting part. You can probably guess what type of things we're going to talk about at that point. Then we're going to see how easy it is to extend ASP.NET Core MPC and see how we can adapt it to newly introduced standards. And then at the end, we're also going to see how can we use simple tools to analyze the solutions that we have created right now and uh, find uh, the stuff that we've, we've talked about. The end, I will conclude, and then there's a question and answer at, at the end of the presentation. So because you're in this room, I'm assuming that you probably are developing .NET or involved with .NET. Is there anybody in this room who's already doing stuff with ASP.NET Core or .NET Core in general? Could you please raise hands? OK, a couple. And are you developing web apps like MVC apps, or are you developing maybe APIs or controllers? I think APIs, controllers? Because um, that's, that's usually the thing that you hear. If you talk to Microsoft, like, why should I use .NET Core or ASP.NET Core? They will say, OK, because of microservices. It's platform agnostic. It, it runs on different platforms, Windows, Linux, Mac OS X. And it's modular based. So that's like a big benefit compared to, let's say, a full framework. .NET you need to install. But ASP.NET ASP Core will be composing itself based on NuGet packages. It will fetch all the dependencies it needs. And then you can execute it. So it's multi-platform. And um, ASP.NET Core MVC is a total rewrite of ASP.NET. And it runs on both .NET Core and the full framework, which I think is a good combination. So you can still use that. And there are several differences, which we will cover during the presentation. But uh, it's definitely not that you are tied to using .NET Core as your main runtime to run it. No, it will also run on the full framework. So a concept, model view controller, probably familiar with that. In this case, the controller has, of course, the biggest responsibility before, for the application. It will decide what type of stuff will be executed. It's the entry point for every request that's being fired against the application. And based on that, it will parse model data, or it will present model data with the help of a view. Right. So that's like the, the abstract pattern. And we're going to solely focus on what controllers give us, what they are doing, and what can go wrong. If we start a new project with MVC Core, you will get this. This is just to illustrate that it's based on a web host builder. It will uh, tie up the whole pipeline. It will do some configuration. And one important piece of this whole configuration is the startup class that has been defined, which you see at, uh, just before the build is being executed. That startup class defines configures uh, two configure methods, which is configure and configure services. And those have internals, which we will cover later on. A side note, all the code that I'm using in these slides are all part of a bigger test app, which I've published on GitHub. And the link is at the end. So you can download it. You can also get all the tools that I'm talking about later on. So 
that's it. So each code element belongs to a bigger solution. So let's move on. Let's, let's first take a look at this, uh, this default controller and then see what's happening. Um, is it really a controller? That's maybe the first question you can ask yourself. If you would have executed this in, an, in an, the old MVC, so not MVC core, this won't be a controller. But with the new MVC core controller, they will find controllers based on conventions, meaning that if it ends with the name controller, it will be found and it will be exposed. So this is a valid controller and it looks pretty minimal, right? It just returns a string of data and it's an index method. If you have that inside your code base, it will be found and it will be exposed. And I think that's already something to be aware of, that the controllers are convention-based found. There's no explicit inheritance needed as in MVC in order to get it exposed. And any assembly that is used inside your app can expose controllers. So if there is a class that ends with the name controller inside of it, it will be exposed because of the convention-based stuff. I think it's good to um, limit the apps or at least limit the controllers and, and limit the way that the application will find it. And within the configure services, there is a, a, the ability to grab the application parts manager, and that one is responsible for resolving all the controllers. And you can limit it. I've got an implementation in the test app. You will see that I will say, okay, only these namespaces are allowed to deliver controllers. It's not completely like locking it down, but at least you know, okay, this is, this is what I would expect. One piece which is also important is, of course, the routing, right? So at some point, a request is being made to an MVC application, and the routing will decide, okay, what's the controller I'm going to instantiate, and what is the method, the action method I'm going to do, execute after that. So if we see this like the default route, that's just the default route you will get for free from a new solution. You will see that there's a controller defined, then it will have an action, and there's an option for a parameter at the end. So if we then try to dissect those two URLs you see over here, we will see like the web app, that's the root of the web application itself. Info stands for info controller. It will execute the edit command, and there's an input parameter uh, defined, or this query string parameter that contains the string data. The second one is another example. It will fire up the info controller. Also, it will execute the delete method. And in this case, there's a route parameter defined as two because that's the optional parameter ID you see over here. And the reason why I'm telling it is because model binding will fetch data from the request. And it will do it based on the form inputs, on the route parameters, or on the query string values, and in that sequence. And there's some magic happening, like convention-based stuff, which we will cover later. But Keep in mind that this is the basis how it works. So if we then move to a more advanced example, this is a controller which inherits from the base controller, which is inside MVC core. That will give you some extra functionality which you can just use that makes life a bit easier. One thing you need to notice is that the constructor of this controller gets a data context, which is just an entity framework context. But um, the nice thing about MVC core is that it has a DI container in by default. And you can just register types and it will be resolved if a controller gets instantiated. So in this case, it gets a data context which will then be used by the create new method you see over here, right? And it's a create new method. It accepts the order as an argument. The context will get the order by adding it. That's the first step. The second step you will see is that it will save the changes to that context and then it will do the redirect to action, right? So if we see this method, What's the first thing that pops in your mind? Or you don't need to shout out, but just give it a thought like, OK, what's, what can be an issue with this? I think, um, does this method act on an HTTP post? Yes, it does. Does this method act on an HTTP GET? Yes, it does. There's no limitation, right? So what you should do is, of course, limit because you don't want a get method at least to in change the internal state of the app, right? So this is a pretty basic thing. We will move to uh, the next problems uh, during this presentation. So bear with me. In this case, it's HTTP post. So what can be another issue if you see this method, right? We, we allow data to be accepted from an external source, and it will then add the order to the context. This is, of course, susceptible to request forgeries, right? So we need to make sure that we put the validate forgery token Method or the attribute on top of it in order to have the double token in one inside of the, the cookie that will be submitted by the browser and one inside the form parameter, and those need to match in order to execute. Right? So this, 
this will make up a better controller than we had when we started out. And keep in mind that if you use the defaults that Visual Studio gives you, then most of the, the, the scaffolding will do, do, will do the right thing. But still, you can decide to develop it yourself. But if you have a model and you generate controllers based on that, it will do a lot of this code plumbing for you. But there are definitely better ways to achieve this. So let's move on. What's the next problem? And I'm already showing this on, on this slide. The, the entity is being accepted from the external source, which is the match of the data model that's directly stored by the ORM, right, by the entity framework context, and there's no validation. So we should at least ask the model binder that, okay, is everything that you've pa parsed, is, is there any error? Did there any error occur? You want to do that. And of course, that's something that you can achieve based on doing data annotations, and that's exactly what we see over here, right? So this is the, the order class that will be accepted, and if you use the data annotations, you can say, this is an email address, uh, needs to be validated, and the same counts for, let's say, I want to limit the description, I'm having a maximum length of 255 characters, right? All still pretty basic stuff. But what's the other issue that we saw earlier, right? And in this case, there is a difference between how MVC Core deals with these types of problems and uh, uh, the full framework MVC. We saw that there were more properties, right? If, if I can go back, you saw that there's even a total price defined in this class, right? So why, and keep in mind, we saw that model binding, so this is something that might be susceptible to mass assignment or overposting of data. So I can give you the data and I can say the total price of this order must not be calculated, but use this value instead. So you want to limit this, right? And you probably are aware of the fact that you can do a bind attribute on that argument in the function that will limit the different properties that are being accepted from the outside. In this case, it's a whitelist only, so that makes it better than MVC, which has got a white and a blacklist, right? You can exclude stuff and you only want to include. So this already makes a bit better of, um, a bit better of processing the orders and, and how we would um, work it through. I'm just gonna do a small sidestep because with that model binding, there are more helper, helper methods inside that base controller you have. And if we then try to, and I'm just gonna talk you through this, a lot of code, but you see that this is a controller method that only accepts an idea as an argument. And there's one method in the middle which does the try update model asynchronously, which internally says, okay, uh, before that it fetches the data element from your ORM and then matches that. And the try model update will map the data coming from the request directly to the data object, right? So in this case, you're doing exactly the same with doing accepting an external entity without limiting the data that they are allowed to, to hand over to you at that point. So this is also an overpost mass assignment in the same way, and this method luckily has got a, an, an overload which allows you to defi define uh, a predicate and saying, okay, in this case, I'm only allowing the amount value to be set throughout this method, right? So still, in combination with the stuff that we've seen before, and, uh, and, and this type of thing, is this definitely the right way of dealing with processing of data? I think there are more stuff, there's more stuff that we can take care of. So first of all, I think rule of thumb for web apps, HTTP GET should never change your application's internal state, right? That's, that's an issue. Second, we want to make sure that we, once we are able to, let's say, post data or do some other, let's say, API call, that we are dealing with cross-site request forgeries in the right way. And that can be achieved by applying the validate forgery token, as we have saw, saw earlier, that attribute on top of the method, or by applying a filter. And in MVC, there is a possibility to push in a filter that will do this for every post and every, every, um, every method except get and head, I believe which will make sure that the token needs to be there in order to process it, right? So you will get um, request forgery tokens by default. It's unfortunate that they did not turn it on. You can still chase the template yourself. But I think by doing that in configure services, right? So this is a snippet of the startup class I talked about earlier. You can say, okay, with the MVC pipeline, I'm just adding this filter by default and it will do the token stuff for you. And the nice thing, um, ASP.NET Core 2.0 was released, I think, a couple of weeks ago. There are tech helpers that will now do the form tags uh, for you, by, and it will also include the token by default, right? So then you're good. And if you're using that auto-validate uh, filter, 
the nice thing is that, of course, somebody then needs to opt out in order to not enforce tokens. So that's a better thing, right? Better than uh, I need to apply it on each of the methods. So moving on to the mass assignment, I think it's always important for data applications or applications that process data that they validate the structure before you continue on making decisions based on that, right? So we should always do data validations based on data annotations and make sure that we ask the model binder that everything went, went well or nothing failed. Second, always make sure that you are, uh, yeah, that you point out where you expect the data to originate from, right? So the model binder will pick and choose based on the sequence I told in the first slide, but you can say to your, to your model, like I'm expecting this one always to come from the form data. Or if you're doing an API, you always say like this is a full data structure that comes from the body of, of the, of the re uh, request. Second, for overposing data, we need to make sure that we use bind elements on attributes if they expose more properties. And for the try update model function, always make use of the one that has the predicate at the end. But what's definitely a better solution, define specific view model classes that will allow you to have request responses for that specific, let's say, create new order method. And that will then be internally mapped to your data structure, right? You don't want to expose the internal data structure, less, let's say, the classes that entity framework uses to the outside world. You just want to map it and move forward and have a decoupling between it. I think that's better. So we talked about the way that you can process data, right? We have seen some basic stuff and how controls are resolved, how it will process data. Then at some point, of course, we need to um, present data. And now I'm going to check if you're still with me because I'm going to do another raise hands. Um, if you see this controller, who thinks there is a problem? And of course, you see, I think I can already explain that there is an, an, an argument being reflected back to the, uh, to the response, right? So it's a typical refractive cross-site scripting. Who thinks this is an issue if we see this? And of course, it feels like a trick question. Who thinks it's an issue? Could you raise hands? In MVC world it is, in core MVC world, it's not an issue because the default content types will take care of this and it will say this is a text plane string I'm returning and with MVC it will always be a text HTML. So that's a, that's a nice, I think, change and it will have a better default compared to MVC. If you do want to have HTML, text HTML returned, you need to annotate it with the producers attribute. This is a similar thing you will see in the Java world, right? You need to like, put it on top and therefore, at that point, it will have content type set to text HTML. And this will have, of course, a cross-site scripting flaw at the end. There is another structure which allows you to do exactly the same, which is also inside of MVC, which is called content result. So in this case, we see that it will just create a content result object and return it and also reflect this. In MVC, this is not vulnerable because you need to make it explicitly returning text HTML as a content type. But in MVC, it will be vulnerable by default. So that's, that, that's, a, that's a big difference. But then, of course, you can ask yourself, like, why should a controller directly return HTML back to a, as a request, right? Maybe you should use a view engine, like Razor, in order to render back the data. First, we're going to see, like, OK, so how can we then do a safer job? Like, if, it's the, if this is the functionality we want to create, like, how can we use proper encoding uh, for this application. The nice thing is that with the whole DI registration of MVC core, you will get uh, a couple of uh, encoders, which is the HTML encoder, the JavaScript encoder, and the URL encoder. And those are encoders which are derived from the anti cross site scripting library. So whitelist, pretty good, internal. And the nice thing is that the DI container can give those to you, and you can just inject them and use them, right? That's exactly what I'm doing over here. So if you then uh, return this and accept the data in HTML encode, then this is not an issue anymore, even if you're turning uh, text HTML back to the, uh, to the end user. As I mentioned, like why would a controller need to render back HTML? Why don't you move to something like a Razor view? Um, as you see over here, this is pretty similar as MVC. This is like almost, almost exactly the same. There are a couple of side steps in order to um, not encode. Like say we see um, there's a model defined and we will iterate over each element in that model collection and we will render back a row for each, each element, right? That's, that's what's happening. 
the item ERO will be encoded. The default razor way will be, okay, this is a data element that you want to render here. I will do the HTML encode. The second one is the HTML raw, which is the same as MVC. It will encapsulate that description as an HTML string, and that will be unencoded, right? So the razor view engine will then render it back, and it will recognize, like, okay, I don't need to re-encode this one. Uh, so in this case, if item description is something that comes from a database that has been put there by a user, then you've got a cross-site scripting issue. Right, so this is similar. And at the bottom, you see a couple of form tech helpers, like the tech helpers I talked about earlier. And the good thing about most of the tech helpers that are in the core framework itself, they all do the context-specific encoding in the right way. So there's no need for you to worry about, about that. So if we then move on and recap, like presenting data, right? It's, not, it's, it's, probably, it's an open door, right? Input validation is important, as we saw earlier. That's for, either, uh, for every application. But we need to make sure that we do the context-specific output encoding where we're rendering back the data. There are a couple of good default encoders. Um, let's say if you're using um, a Chinese character set or a Russian character set, these encoders will also encode those to the HTML encoded equivalents. The nice thing about the ability to um, influence the DI, you can say, okay, but I want to have this code page excluded from the encoding, right? So you can still configure it. So it's not that it's completely closed for you to modify. The default is pretty good. If you want to open up more and allow those Chinese characters not to be encoded, you can still do that. As I mentioned, the tech helpers that are in all do a pretty good job with just encoding the right data for the right context. And you need to keep an eye on uh, if somebody uses HTML string or HTML raw, because that will be uh, data that will be unencoded. OK, so we talked about processing data, we talked about the way that we can present data. The next thing up will be like, how can we extend MVC core? And how can we leverage, let's say, new web standards? I'm gonna to briefly touch the concept of same side cookies. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you're probably familiar with that, but let me briefly talk you through. So same side cookie is a standard that allows you to instruct the browser to limit the use of a cookie for that origin, right? There are two policies, which is called lax and strict. And strict will allow the browser to behave in the same way if you would have turned off third-party cookies in your browser. Meaning that if you would log on to Facebook, if you then go back to a new site, and then want to go back to Facebook throughout a link, then your browser won't submit that cookie with your session uh, identified inside of it, right? So it will instruct the browser to limit cookie usage for a specific origin. Luckily, there's also something called lags, which is a bit more tolerant, and that navigation back throughout the link from one side to another will still allow the browser to submit that. So it gives more control over the cookies and the way that it's used. It can be a good control, mitigating control for request forgeries. Can you probably imagine that once somebody has the ability to determine your tokens, right? He has maybe compromised something else, and he's got a list of valid tokens. He can still create a form that he yeah, then puts on the elements in, including that token, and then forces the user to post that data back to the server. That will work. If that cookie is being flagged for same site, then the request forgery token will be limited, and it won't be submitted, right? And with ASP.NET Core MVC, we have that double submit, like we have that cookie value and that form value that needs to be present. So by cutting off that cookie, that uh, attack will be unsuccessful. So it's a nice mitigating control. The second thing, which I also think is pretty good, like um, last year during um, a series of, of the series of security, um, security events that happened, um, a guy, Tom van Goetem from the KU Leuven, showed stuff about uh, resource leakage and about the way that you can use it as a side channel to determine if somebody is a member or what somebody's interests are, right? So he, you can probably imagine that if you're on Facebook and you've got an active session, you download your picture, your profile picture, and that size of that picture will be, of course, it will be more than somebody who is not part or not logged on to Facebook, right? And that's a difference, and you can leverage that difference. The guy has got a, a series of different ways on how to determine different sizes on, in, inside the browser. But the nice thing that if you had same site on a cookie, on your session cookie, and somebody requests that image in another source, then that will be cut off because that's exactly what same site does. It will uh, not submit that session cookie, and therefore it will, it will be more hard to do that uh, resource, uh, cross origin resource attack. So how can we 
use same side cookies inside of MVC core. So the nice thing is that it hooks up a whole pipeline and in that pipeline, as I mentioned, there's DI happening and you can do a lot of configuration. And by configuring the service for uh, cookie authentication options, we can override the cookie manager that's used. So in this case, I'm replacing the cookie manager for the authentication options with my own same site cookie manager. And this, this is sufficient. Aside from the fact that, of course, the same site uh, cookie manager needs to be implemented, um, it allows you to be, to be replaced. In my demo app, there's the implementation. You can figure it out uh, after the session. But it will have the same site lax flag being added to your cookie. It is nice. They're, okay, so it's doable, right? I don't, like when I was working on this, I thought like, okay, it's probably something that they can change. And that's exactly what they did with MVC Core 2, uh, which was released a couple of weeks ago. So what they've done is they've fully rewritten the cookie policy middleware, or at least they introduced something called cookie policy middleware that allows you to have more control over the way that the cookies are rendered. And it has same site, and it will turn same site lax on for your session cookie, and it will do the strict one on your request forgery cookies, which is exactly the two scenarios I just explained. So by default, it already does it if you do a new uh, ASP.NET Core 2.0 project. I think that's a good thing. Only the browsers need to support. I believe it's only Chrome and Safari that have support right now for this type of cookies. So moving on and seeing that we have seen how we can process data, how we can present data back to the user, how we can leverage the pipeline and extend it ourselves with the stuff that we want to do. Let's move on to how can we then analyze solutions and the solutions that we created for these types of issues, right? And um, Microsoft has, has done a rewrite of their compiler stack, which is called Project Roslin. You're probably aware of it. But with that, they also introduced something called code analysis. And there are different ways you can use it, right? But the nice thing is that you can easily create simple checks and you can extend it and use it in Visual Studio directly, but you can just create simple checks that will check the presence of, let's say, an attribute on a specific method or um, check if model state is valid, is explicitly called inside that body of that controller method, right? So I think pretty powerful if you have those small tools available and I think it's a missed opportunity if you, if you don't use it. One downside with the current, like the latest release of, of .NET Core is that because they're like releasing in a quick pace, um, Roslyn doesn't deal pretty good with, um, with, the, with the current web project format. It won't read it. And you would have liked to have a compilation of your project available because aside from the syntax trees, you can also ask uh, stuff about like what's the type of object I'm dealing with right now, right? It's not a string literal that you're searching for, but you want to have some type information. And unfortunately, based on the project itself, it's not possible. But we can still iterate over, let's say, find every controller inside my solution, and that's what I'm doing in the demo app, and then create a syntax tree from that controller class. And you can easily say, okay, give me back all the public methods of this syntax tree of this controller class. And then go over the attribute list and see if there's an HTTP post. And if there's an HTTP post attribute being defined on that method, I want to make sure that the validate forgery token attribute is also present, right? So that will mark off the first check. The second check is the same. It will loop over the functions, but it will also check if the body of the method has got the model state is valid check inside of it, right? So it won't say necessarily that they do proper validation. No, it will just mark, okay, it is part of this function, and if it's not there, you can always check it out. So it's small, simple checks, and I think that's good to help out to do a better job at the end. And it doesn't exclude all the other stuff that we need to do if we're developing secure software like threat modeling or static analysis or even manual pen testing, right? So pretty powerful, out of the box, it's available, and you will find it back in my test app. You can just use it in the same way. So with that said, um, I'm gonna wrap it up with my conclusion. Um, I think it's important to be aware of the fact that the attack surface of, of an ASP.NET Core MVC application depends on the controllers that are resolved, like the stuff that we've seen earlier. And of course, still basic rules count um, as we have seen, right? You still need to do input validation. You're not like walking away from that. Output encoding is also still needed. I do know that compared to MVC, 
the defaults are definitely better, right? We have seen the defaults, let's say, for that reflective cross-site scripting thing that you need to explicitly turn it off in order to do uh, the wrong thing, and I think that's good. So definitely the programming APIs give good, good guidance, and uh, yeah, the, you really need to code in order to be unsafe. And I also think like the example we have seen with the, with the standards and the way that you can extend uh, MVC core, the quick cycle in the way that they release allows also more innovation compared to, let's say, MVC. And uh, yeah, that's a good thing. And that will allow you to anticipate m much more earlier. And that, I think that's good. So with that said, um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty short on time. That's what I'm seeing right now. Um, I've got plenty of time left for questions. Are there any questions? The mic here, if anyone has a question. Um, do you have any examples of the new data protection API that there was just released? Uh, no. <laughs> Quick answer. I'm sorry. No. How you can use it? No. Like it's it's the same. Like. Um, if you search, I think maybe the, the, the document side of Microsoft, there's a pretty comprehensive document. It's the same counts for the cross-site scripting stuff I talked about, docs.microsoft.com. Yeah, I've got, got some good examples, and maybe the, uh, the API, uh, the data protection APIs are also part of it. I'm not sure. Figure it out. Okay. Anyone else? No. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks <laughs> for your time. Safe travels back home, and see you next time. Yes.